Well, I'm glad you could join us for our Midway Baptist Church of Athens, Alabama adult Sunday school lesson. I hope that you'll uh, be blessed by it. Uh, we continue to uh, place these on YouTube each week, uh, and we'll continue to do so until such time as it's appropriate for us to begin meeting again in small groups. Uh, we continue to have virtual worship services at this time. Uh, we're reviewing that uh, on a weekly or bi-weekly basis to determine when it would be appropriate for us to again assemble for congregational worship. Uh, so you can join us uh, on Facebook each Sunday morning as we live stream our worship service. Or if you're unable to do that, you can also uh, look on YouTube, usually on Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening, uh, where the worship service will be posted for your viewing, and I'm sure you'll receive a blessing for that. Also remember Doc Overholt in his uh, verse by verse uh, study of Colossians uh, as that uh, continues each week as well and is uh, placed on YouTube. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for uh, this time we're able to spend together. I thank you for your word, uh, for your love and your, for your mercy and your grace. Uh, pray, uh, Father, that you'll help us that we uh, will always celebrate the gift of salvation that you've given to us and I pray that you'll bless our time together as we study that you'll help us that everything that we say and do would be pleasing to you Father I pray that you'll guide our thoughts I pray that above all you'll be honored and glorified and empowered by all that we say and do just pray you'll bless our time of study for it's in Christ's name I pray Amen well, Today our uh, lesson title is Forgives, and this is the lesson for February 7th of 2021, and uh, our passages, uh, focal passages, will be from Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 26. Um, just kind of as an introduction, uh, I looked at uh, some of my hymn books and uh, wanted to name a few hymns uh, that would portray Jesus' forgiveness. We often sing about uh, forgiveness and being saved. Uh, and the ones that I wrote down, and of course there are many, many that I could have written down, but uh, nothing but the blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And then uh, also I wrote down, Now I belong to Jesus. Verse 3 says, Joy floods my soul, for Jesus has saved me, freed me from sin that long had enslaved me. And the old rugged cross, verse 3, for it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. And then also, all that thrills my soul, verse 3 of that hymn, how my sin, uh, red like crimson, can be whiter than the snow. And just as I am, just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, Relieve. And as I said, there are many others that we could have uh, written down that had uh, references to the forgiveness that we have from sins, the miraculous gift that was given to us uh, as Jesus paid the price for our sins on the cross of Calvary and, uh, and uh, the, the resurrection that uh, we celebrate each year on the third day after he was placed in that tomb. And... Uh, the fact that he lives eternally uh, in heaven and that he's coming back for us soon. Well, the people around Galilee had heard Jesus preach and they'd seen many miracles uh, that he had performed. Uh, yet we see that many who lived during that time of his earthly ministry failed to see the greatest gift that he brought and that was the gift of forgiveness for our sins. For hundreds of years, uh, Judaism had been under the sacrificial system where one type of burnt offering was called a sin offering uh, that was something that could be done pretty regularly and then they also observed a national day of atonement once a year where the high priest uh, went through a process for the forgiveness of the sins of the nation of Israel but the sacrificial did nothing uh, to eternally forgive the sins it only postponed those sins to the time when the perfect sacrifice would be made and that would be made by Jesus 
Nevertheless, today we'll see that uh, uh, that he proclaimed his authority to forgive sins. As we study, we're going to seek to gain a more complete understanding of forgiveness. In last week's lesson, we discussed the early verses in chapter 5 where we saw the call of the fishermen, Peter, James, and John. And uh, the later verses uh, where Jesus called Levi to be one of his disciples or his apostles, uh, the tax collector, and then following that call, the feast that Levi gave uh, at his home, uh, and the famous statement that Jesus made uh, during that feast as he was uh, criticized by the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Today's lesson covers the verses between these two accounts, the account of the calling of Peter, James, and John, and the calling of Levi or Matthew. Um, so as we look at, at what happened today, it's going to take place in, uh, in Capernaum, and we've looked at the map before, but uh, we find that Capernaum is, is up here. It's on the north end of the Sea of Galilee, and uh, uh, this is where Jesus was ministering. It was kind of his adopted hometown. Uh, we earlier had talked about his rejection by the people of his hometown in Nazareth and that uh, he kind of set up his headquarters in, in Capernaum. So as we read our first scripture passage, listen for the examples of hope uh, that we see in this passage. And we're going to look at uh, Luke 5 verses 17 through 19. Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, uh, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and led him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. So uh, when we think about hope, uh, the hope that occurred in these, in these verses, first of all, we can think about the hope of the paralyzed man, hoping that he could be healed of his paralysis. Uh, also the hope uh, of the men who brought him. The, the, they had heard of Jesus, certainly. Some of them may have uh, actually witnessed miraculous healings that Jesus had accomplished uh, in, in the local area. So they brought this man to Jesus. Both the man and Jesus really believed that Jesus could heal the paralytic. They had hope. Not only did they have hope, but they were very persistent in their approach. They didn't just give up when they couldn't get in the front door of this of this house. I've always for some reason pictured four men, but we're not told how many men there were that took him up on the roof. I suppose it could have been two or maybe three just as well. We're just not told. I'd like to share with you though uh, uh, a comment that J. Vernon McGee has uh, and I'll read that to you. So J. Vernon McGee says, and I quote, there are many people who are not going to receive the message of salvation unless you lift a corner of their stretcher and carry them to the place where they can hear the word of the Lord. They are paralyzed and mobilized by sin and many other things the world holds for them. Some are paralyzed by prejudice and others by indifference. They are never going to hear Jesus say to them, Thy sins are forgiven thee unless you take the corner of their stretcher and bring them to him. All of these incidents reveal the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ wants us to spread the message of salvation to others. This is why I preach the word of God. And remember that one man cannot carry a stretcher alone. It took four men uh, to carry the stretcher of the paralyzed man. More men and women are needed today to help get the word of God out to those who need him. 
So J. Vernon McGee also assumed that there were four men, but we, uh, again, we just don't know how many there were. We're not told how many there were. Um, so these Pharisees and these teachers of the law, or the scribes, uh, who were there to, for one reason, and that was to critique or criticize Jesus or to find something in Jesus that would allow him to allow them to um, uh, to punish him in some way. Uh, we're told that they came from many places. Some came from Galilee. It says some came from Judea, from Jerusalem, which could have been almost a hundred miles away. Uh, and as the men approached this house. Um, carrying their friend no one moved uh, to give them access to Jesus as J. Vernon McGee stated there are some who are lost who are perishing as Brother Jerome read from 2 Corinthians in a sermon last Sunday uh, who need access to Jesus we as believers can either be part of the problem of keeping them from coming to Jesus or we can be part of the solution the solution is that we uh, as believers are to share the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not only the good news, but we're to witness to them about uh, what Jesus means to us and what he's done in our own lives uh, without judgment or prejudice toward whoever it is that we might be witnessing to. As the men began tearing through the roof, I can imagine there was some debris falling down. And uh, one commentary that I read said the owner of the house may have been uh, concerned or upset by this uh, debris that was falling from uh, the ceiling. Uh, this commentator speculated uh, that Jesus may, may have just given the owner of the house a reassuring look to calm him down. And uh, I wondered, as I read this, I wondered if... Uh, if Jesus, after all this was over with, uh, went up on that roof and helped to repair uh, the damage that was done. He had carpentry skills, certainly. He had grown up and had been taught to be a carpenter by Joseph, and he could have done that. And I don't think that would have been out of character for him to have offered uh, the owner of the house to repair the damage that these men did. Uh, as we read the next passage, let's pay attention to the different perspectives uh, of those who were there and what their perspective was on forgiveness. And we're going to look at Luke 5, 20 through 24. When he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise up and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. I was reminded uh, as I read this uh, of James 2.18 that stated, But some will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And we should never misinterpret that uh, to mean that we can earn salvation, because we certainly can't. None of us is worthy of salvation. But we can say that we are saved by grace, through our faith in Jesus Christ. And when we are saved, there will be evidence in our lives of that salvation that has occurred. This, as Brother Jerome read again from 2 Corinthians 2.15 last Sunday, makes us the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. So the paralyzed man and his friends got more than they expected. They had hoped that they would find healing for this man, but they came away with something much, much greater than that. They came away with forgiveness of sins. On the other hand, the scribes and the Pharisees had accused Jesus of blasphemy because he proclaimed 
to the paralyzed man that his sins were forgiven. They were right in thinking that only God could forgive sins or God had the right to forgive sins, but they didn't understand or even really want to accept that Jesus was making that exact point that he could forgive sins because he was God. We also see in this passage that Jesus referred to himself as uh, the Son of Man. And he did that quite often. That, that was a common way that he referred to himself. Uh, it was the same as proclaiming himself to be the Messiah. And that's really based on Old Testament references. We can see uh, many of the prophecies in the Old Testament uh, use that terminology as well. And then in Acts 7.56, as Stephen was being martyred, he said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So this term that Jesus used for himself uh, was a term that uh, told people that he was, in fact, the Messiah, the expected Messiah that the, that the Jews had been expecting for uh, hundreds of years. Jesus, uh, just as Jesus' identity came into conflict with the preconceived ideas about him, at that time, we find that uh, the preconceived ideas that people have about Jesus today comes into conflict with what the truth is. There's a wide variation in our society today about what people think about Jesus, who he was, uh, uh, what he came for, and, and the truth that is in, in the Word of God. And the truth is that uh, he has told us, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. He is the only way. Scribes and Pharisees perceived Jesus as a blasphemer and an imposter, and they refused to believe. Uh, many others perceived Jesus as a great prophet with healing power. Some believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but their perception of the Messiah was one who had come to uh, free them from the rule of the of the Roman government but Jesus was much more he came to provide forgiveness of sins that uh, Judaism's sacrificial system uh, could not provide he came to show us God in person as he lived his life on earth so that we would be able to relate to his love his compassion and his sinless life and that we would follow him and that we would seek to emulate him uh, in our own lives because we've accepted him into our hearts. I'm going to read uh, Luke 5, 25, 26, our last uh, passage. Immediately he rose up before them and took up what he had been lying on and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. So we, we can look at these passages and we might think about a word that describes the crowd. I thought about as this man uh, got up to his feet, maybe for the first time in his life, and started to walk out. He had to walk out through that same door that he and his friends couldn't come in because of the crowd. And I'm sure as he was commanded by Jesus to leave and to go to his home and as he started to walk out uh, that the crowd moved aside to make room for him when they had not made room for him uh, when his friends brought him on a stretcher on his bed uh, so he he was glorifying God and, and in fact uh, the entire group of people with just some exceptions were also glorifying God we could maybe think of words that might characterize this. They may have been uh, awed by what had happened. They certainly were amazed uh, by what had happened. They were glorifying God uh, because of what had happened. Uh, but the religious leaders, um, we have to think, had a different attitude. Uh, they, they may have seen these miraculous things occur. They may have thought, well, this, is, this was a setup. This was some sort of uh, uh, prearranged uh, thing to, to uh, 
imitate a miracle, and likely they did. Uh, they may have been resentful of what happened, and that, that Jesus was able, because of the power that he had been given, uh, to, hear, to heal this man and to forgive his sins. Uh, they were likely angry, and they were likely vengeful. Again, just trying to find some means by which they could accuse him of, uh, of violating uh, God's word. So as the paralyzed man and the others glorified God for what they've witnessed, uh, we find today as we experience uh, forgiveness because we've invited Christ into our hearts, because we've been saved, because we are no longer among the perishing, but those who are being saved, uh, we should have a great desire uh, to worship him, just as many of these people in this house had a desire to worship, and we should seize every opportunity to praise God and to glorify God uh, for what's happened in our own lives. I pray that we'll always do that, that we will praise him, that we'll honor him, and that we'll worship him because of the miracle that he has performed in our lives. Let's pray. Father, I thank you again for your word um, that you've given to us for a guide for our lives. I thank you, Father, for this time of study together. I pray that uh, you'll bless our pastor, Father, bless our church as we attempt to be salt and light in this community for you. Father, I pray for our nation uh, that we would turn toward you. I pray for the effectiveness of this vaccine, Father, that we would see it uh, bring this pandemic under control. Pray, Father, for all that are sick. Father, those uh, who have been affected by COVID-19. Father, those who are bereaved as a result of the loss of loved ones. I pray for those who are brokenhearted, Father, uh, because of whatever their situation might be in life. Just pray, Father, for your guidance and your direction for us as we serve you. And and for our leaders uh, of our nation, Father, that uh, they would seek your wisdom and that they would use it as they make decisions. Thank you, Father, for loving us uh, first. And, Father, we love you. We pray, Father, that you'll forgive us for our sins. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, thanks once again for joining us. And until we meet again, may the good Lord bless and keep you.